Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming to today's uh, Meet Your Professor event with Dr. Jeff Reed. Um, Dr. Jeffrey Reed has lived in many different places, such as West Virginia, Northern California, Massachusetts, Savannah, Georgia, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Springfield, and Dayton, Ohio, Boise, Idaho, and now Atlanta, Colorado. But he considers Washington, D.C. and Northern Virginia as his home. He graduated from Langley High School in McLean, Virginia in 1976 as a perfectly normal middle-class suburban kid and took the next 10 years to complete his undergraduate degree. <laughs> and then he went to graduate school for the next 10 years. He has an AOB uh, from MSIX from Harvard University and an MA and PhD uh, 98 from Emory University in Atlanta, completing his dissertation on political thoughts in early national Virginia under the direction of Elizabeth Fox Genovese. He taught part-time at a number of colleges, Oglethorpe and Decatur Community College, now Georgia Perimeter College, Grand Valley State University in Michigan, American University in DC, all while working other various jobs, such as a writer, educator, or sorry, editor for a USAID, USAID contractor in DC. He started teaching full-time at Clark State Community College in Springfield, Ohio in 2004, and has been teaching ever since at the College of Western Idaho and now Otero College. Along the way, he married his lovely wife, Heather, and acquired a number of dogs in the cat with her. He likes to read a lot, play some games every now and then, and occasionally act in a Pick a Wire theater production. Everyone, please help me welcome Dr. Jeffrey Reed. <clears throat> I should be loud enough to have to use this. So, uh, the topic, Saturday Night Massacre at 50. Uh, so this was in 1973, uh, October 20th, 1973, President Richard Nixon precipitated the Saturday Night Massacre, and 50 years later we're still living with it <clears throat> and the effects of it. So I thought 50 seemed like a pretty good anniversary to celebrate. Uh, all the celebration uh, may not be the right word, but it's a celebration of both its effect on American politics and political culture, but also on the individual culture of a specific person. <clears throat> um, so, I'm going to set this up by Fired agents of the FBI acting at the direction of the White House and the sealed off the offices of the special prosecutor, the offices of the Attorney General, and the offices of the Deputy Attorney General. Six FBI agents present here, completing our operations right now. All of this adds up to a total and unprecedented situation, a grave and profound crisis in which the President has set himself against his own Attorney General and the Department of Justice. Nothing like this has ever happened before. So if you happened to be watching the TV that night, you would have seen that special report <clears throat> from John Chancellor uh, about what he called a grave constitutional crisis. Uh, this didn't happen in a vacuum, of course. Uh, there was a lot of context going on. The Yom Kippur War between uh, Egypt, Syria, and Israel had broken out on October 6th, so that was two weeks before this, uh, which led to the first energy crisis when the Organization of Arab Petroleum Exporting Countries put an embargo on the United States for supplying Israel with military equipment. Uh, there was the beginnings of stagflation and the economy going into a deep recession. <clears throat> uh, Vice President Spiro Agnew resigned on October 10th just before this, uh, with other charges of corruption and taking bribes. So a lot of stuff was going on, and the Middle East War threatened to lead to a conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union directly. <clears throat> One year earlier, in 1972, Richard Nixon had won one of the biggest landslides in the history of the United States. Uh, he had won 521 electoral votes to George McGovern's 17, and he had won 49 states 
against McGovern's one state and the District of Columbia. And he was riding very high as a result of this, but there was a skeleton rattling in his closet that he was not really aware of. And that was that it would eventually derail his presidency. <laughs> um, and that was Watergate. Uh, now, I'm not going to go into all the details of Watergate because it's extremely complicated. But it plays a direct role in what happened in October of 1973. What came to be called Watergate was when seven, uh, five burglars were caught in planting bugs and photographing documents in the Democratic National Committee headquarters office, which was in the Watergate complex. <clears throat> uh, they were working on behalf of the president's reelection committee, the committee to reelect the president, also affectionately known as CREEP. Uh, and they were arrested by the police and caught. <clears throat> uh, within a few days, the president and his chief of staff, Bob Haldeman, were trying to figure out how to minimize the damage. Uh, and the real problem was the involvement of the burglars in other illegal activities, such as breaking into Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office to get dirt on him. Uh, and this was raised issues that were very serious and politically problematic. The White House managed to keep the lid on until after the election. <clears throat> uh, various White House staff, like John Dean, were in charge of managing this. They listened to the FBI. They, uh, read, they were there for the interviews. They tried to really shape the investigation. Uh, and this is what led to the cover-up of the Watergate crime. <clears throat> uh, this lid came off in spring of 1973 when one of the burglars, James McCord, who had been the security director for the committee to re-elect the president, sent a letter to Judge Sirica, who was the judge presiding over the trial, saying that there had been pressure put on the Watergate defendants to stay silent and to plead guilty, uh, that the White House was somehow or other involved, that there were, were White House aides that had uh, suborned perjury and obstructed justice. When this all came out, uh, this led to the press focusing more and more attention on Congress focusing more and more attention and the heat began to turn up on the White House as the focus shifted to the cover-up away from the original crime. <clears throat> and the cover-up that they had had began to unravel. The Senate committee was formed to investigate Watergate, um, and then Nixon's top aides, Haldeman, Ehrlichman, and others resigned, including the Attorney General at the time, Richard Kleinson. Dean, John Dean, had been in charge of kind of maneuvering this cover-up for all these years, for all that year. Um, and in the summer of 1973, he was called to testify from the Senate Watergate Committee. <clears throat> and he laid out in a several hours of testimony everything that he knew, including the implication of the president and all of his top assistants had been involved in planning and implementing cover-up of a crime. But there was no evidence to show that Dean was right. <clears throat> and the White House denied that Dean's allegations were correct. Other people went and testified in front of the committee and said Dean was lying. Um, and Dean had really no way of proving any of the allegations that he made were true. <clears throat> But the proof existed, just no one knew about it, until one of the lower level White House aides who had another job in the administration at that time was called in by the Senate committee staffers to talk about how the White House worked. They just didn't know where the information flowed, who was in charge of what, who sat where, who did what things for the president. And they just wanted to get a clear idea of this. And so they were talking to him, and then, just out of the blue, one of the lawyers for the uh, 
uh, committee asked him, he said, do you know of any way that there would be that the president uh, had uh, transcripts of conversations that took place in the Oval Office, or that there were recordings of things? And Butterfield apparently put his head in his hands and he said, uh, yes. <laughs> Richard Nixon in 1971 had installed a taping system in the White House, in the Oval Office, in his study upstairs on all the phones coming out of the Oval Office in his study and in his own special office hideaway in the building next door. A taping system that was completely automatic. You didn't have to hit a button. It was voice activated. As soon as someone started talking, it started recording. And everything that was it said in the White House, Oval Office, or in his office for two years was being recorded. Uh, next day, he went out in public and he made this statement, and now we have a real flaw. <clears throat> Nixon wanted to keep the tapes himself, he wanted to keep them away from prosecutors, he wanted to keep them away from the FBI and the Senate committee, uh, but evidence is evidence. And so the tapes became a rope in a tug of war between Richard Nixon and this man, Archibald Cobb. Elliot Richardson, I'll make him a sign here, I went to school with his father in high school. Elliot Richardson was the Attorney General and when he took the job, uh, he was given the authority to appoint a special prosecutor to look into all the Watergate allegations. He appointed Archibald Cox to do that and promised the Senate during his confirmation hearing that he would not uh, do anything to interfere with Cox's investigation. <clears throat> uh, but Cox now knows that there are tapes of all of the conversations taking place in the White House, and so he subpoenas them, which is what you do in a court case. And they wanted to get all of the tapes themselves so they could actually hear what the people had said. And this would prove any of the other allegations such as that Dean had made. Um, and so he went to court to get these tapes. Nixon refuses to give over the tapes. He goes to the Court of Appeals and the Court of Appeals says, Nixon, you need to give the tapes. And uh, Nixon says, no, I'm not going to give the tapes. Uh, and they try to come up with all kinds of experiments to figure out how can we do this? give the information that's in the tapes, but not give the tapes themselves. <clears throat> and they come up with different ideas, but in September and August of 1973, they come up with a plan where they will produce summaries of what happened in the conversations. We'll give those summaries to Senator John Stennis, who's about 187 years old and hard of hearing, let him listen to to make sure that what we have in the summaries is correct, and then we'll give that to the prosecutor as the evidence. <clears throat> in the meantime, all of these other conflicts, wars, resignations are taking place. <clears throat> Nixon claims executive privilege for his tapes, and he doesn't want to give them up. Cox needs those tapes because that's the evidence that he needs in order to be able to prove that something had happened and who was involved. In all of this. Nixon had hoped that he would get Elliot Richardson, who was the Attorney General, uh, to get Cox to agree to this. Um, and then, furthermore, Cox would then say that he would not try to get any more tapes. So he was trying to limit the investigation, President Nixon. Um, and Cox said no. On uh, October 20th, just in the afternoon, he Cox held a press conference and said, I can't do it. I gotta get the tapes. This is the evidence that I need. It's for the court, it's for the defendant's right, as well as the prosecution's right. Everyone needs to have the best evidence in order to be able to prove what happened. Um, and he said he was going to go to the Supreme Court and ask them to rule on this and force Nixon to turn it over his tapes. Nixon's response was to fire Cox. 
You know, he couldn't do it directly. He had to get the Attorney General, Richardson, to actually do the firing. <clears throat> and he called Richardson to the White House in the afternoon of October 20th, and he said, I want you to fire Cox, and Richardson basically said no. And he quit. And there's a great line here where Nixon says to Richardson, he says, I'm sorry that you put your own personal principles ahead of the good of the country. And Cox is, and Richardson's reply is, Mr. President, what I think I'm doing is for the good of the country. <sighs> so he quits. They go to the next man down, William Ruckel's house, and he gets fired because he won't fire him anyway. They go to the third man at the Department of Justice, Robert Bork, and he agrees to fire him because he says the president needs to have his way. <clears throat> so Cox gets fired, and that's what leads to the FBI and the police shutting down the investigation, locking the doors, and kicking all of the special prosecutor's lawyers out. When the news gets out on this, it creates a firestorm of public opinion. <clears throat> People did not expect this. They did this on a Saturday evening, so attention to all of this, and all of a sudden this news comes out that he has fired the special prosecutor, and within two days, there is a complete shift in public opinion on Watergate, and on Monday morning, people begin to introduce resolutions of impeachment into the House of Representatives. This only took a couple of days. Now, that's the Saturday night massacre. Now, all this was watched <laughs> by a gawky 14-year-old uh, sophomore at Miami High School in McLean, Virginia, uh, who was just really becoming interested in politics and American government. Uh, I was... Much more dynamic picture. Uh, but I had always been interested in history, but I had always been really unfocused. Uh, I read a lot of books about World War II, Civil War, and those kinds of things. Uh, in 1972, I actually did work uh, hanging out flyers for George McGovern, being the radical liberal that I was back then. Um, and, uh, but watching all of this unfold <clears throat> in front of me, in 1973, uh, really kind of pushed me into the direction of wanting to understand why these things happen and not just what happens. <clears throat> uh, in July of 1973, I actually got to shake Richard Nixon's hand at the White House. I was there when the Japanese Prime Minister arrived for talks, and I pushed my way up to the front. I had to get right in front. I forgot to put my button on, but I had a giant button. If you come down to my office, you can see it. I still have it. And so Nixon's the one water gate on it. I got right up there so I could shake his hand and you could see my button. Although I don't think he knows. So. But then I went from the White House directly to the Capitol building to go to the Senate water gate hearings, which were open to the public. Uh, all the public had to stand up in the back. <laughs> um, and uh, so, I, this sort of got me more and more and more interested in what was going on, and why these things were happening, and who was involved. Um, and so it, it kind of set me on the current trajectory that I'm, I've been on for the last you know, 50 years, I guess. Um, and the Saturday Night Massacre had that consequence for both me and for the United States. It began the end of Nixon's presidency. I don't know how to show this. I can't watch it. It was the last time. Um, but on August 8, 1974, uh, Nixon ended up having to resign from his office. I have never been a quitter. To leave an office before my term was completed is abhorrent to every instinct in my life. As president, I must put the interests of America first. America needs a full-time president. 
and a full-time homeless. Particularly at this time, with problems we face at home abroad. To continue the fight through the months ahead for my personal vindication would almost totally absorb the time and attention of both the President and the Congress in a period when our entire efforts should be on the great issue of peace abroad and prosperity without reflection at home. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effectively that new command. Vice President Cole will be sworn in as president at that hour in his office. So Nixon ended up having to quit because the walls were closing in on him. <clears throat> he wanted to try to keep the tapes from coming public, but the House Judiciary Committee in 1974, which was considering impeachment against him. Uh, demanded tapes. The courts were still looking for more tapes. Uh, he tried to appease people by issuing his own transcripts. Uh, but in the end of July 1974, the Supreme Court rules eight to nothing that Nixon has to turn over the tapes. Uh, that executive privilege does exist, but it does not cover criminal conspiracies that might be discussed in the White House. When that comes out, there's a tape in there, June 23, 1972, just five days after the Watergate break-in, where, where Nixon and his aide Holman are discussing using the CIA to block the FBI investigation. <clears throat> and that is the beginning of the cover-up right there. That's the smoking gun tape. And when it's released, Nixon support disappears. But the New York Times headline, it's one of the biggest headlines they ever put in the New York Times. As Nixon was on, um, and he left office. Watergate, Saturday Night Massacre, which began the end of the presidency, still has a lot of meaning. We have a special prosecutor right now. <clears throat> Was looking at President Trump's actions on January 6, 2021. Uh, we had Ken Starr back in the days of Bill Clinton looking at the uh, Monica Lewinsky and the other potential scandals for Clinton's administration. Uh, special prosecutors are now more independent than they were because of what happened in October 1973. <clears throat> uh, they are insulated from interference by the President and even the Department of Justice once they are appointed into office. But it's more than that. <clears throat> Saturday Night Massacre really represented not just a turning point from Watergate, but it really changed the nature of the political and judicial system. <clears throat> The tapes were covered by executive privilege, is what Nixon claimed, but the court rules that that does not cover criminal conspiracies. The President, the Congress, and the judiciary are equal branches of government. No one is supposed to have the upper hand over the other. But what the Saturday Night Massacre and the results of that established was that the President is not above the law. <clears throat> that the courts and the judicial process have to have higher standing than the presidency for secrecy and security. <clears throat> um, and so the president has been put below and the law itself is more important than, any, than anything that the president can claim as his independent or in office. <clears throat> there is such a thing as executive privilege, but it has limits. National security is no longer able to cover any kind of action that the president thinks. Nixon himself said later on that if the president says to do it, it's legal. And that's clearly not the case, and that is what was established right here after this event. So, there he is, three years later, 
<laughs> getting ready to go to his high school prom. Um, but actually, I think in a lot of ways, this has been, it was a focusing event for me. It was something that happened that really got me interested in going deeper into this. So when I went off to college after this year, uh, I always knew that I would be a history major and I wanted to investigate and look at these things. Uh, there's a theory, I, I, I guess it's mine, but I'm sure I've heard about it. <laughs> so, uh, generations have different, um, have different events or contexts that kind of shape them. There's the Kennedy assassination, there's the uh, landing on the moon, there's uh, Vietnam War. And, you know, I'm, a, I'm a child of the 70s, and that's Watergate. <laughs> And it, it, I think a lot of people from the 70s kind of get the reputation of that it's cynical and cynicism spread around. Uh, but I think it's actually, for me, it's been something that really, uh, I won't say inspired, because it's not quite the right word, but it's something that really empowered me into wanting to and wanting to find out. <clears throat> and being able to look back and try to understand how these things happen and how the world works. So, thank you, Richard Nixon, <laughs> for getting me to where I am right now. Uh, and uh, that's it. So if there's any questions, I can ask a little bit. Oh, look at that time. I left two minutes for questions. Thank you all very much. So.